our final speaker before we have coffee. Our afternoon tea break is a bit of a legend. He's a well-respected columnist with the Sydney Morning Herald and the Sun Herald. He's a television presenter, and of course, he's been he's represented Australia playing footy. Since that time, he's become a hugely successful author of I think it's more than 20 books. I may have made that up, but a phenomenal number of books. And for several years, he's been Australia's best-selling non-fiction writer. So now, to tell his own story, would you please welcome the legendary Peter Fitzsimons? Thank you very much, Gretel, and thank you all for that very tepid welcome. That's not a bad welcome. I'll, I'll warm it up as we go along. But anyway, I'm delighted to be here in this fantastic venue. I suspect after that uh, intro from Gretel, a lot of you would be looking at me thinking, well, he looks like a former footballer, no doubt about that. There is no way on earth, however, he looks like an author. And if you are thinking that, you're not the first to have so thought. About 20 years ago, I was invited to the highly prestigious opening of the Rembrandt exhibition at the New South Wales Art Gallery, only invited to this black tie soiree because my sister-in-law was the curator who would brought it all the way from Holland. And before attending, she'd given me strict instruction, how to wear the black tie properly, how to hold the champagne glass by the stem, and we don't guzzle and throw it down our throat. We sip and we converse and we move on. And I was desperately trying to fit in with the glitterati of the Sydney arts world. Couldn't help but notice the executive director general of the New South Wales Art Gallery, Edmund Capon, kept sneaking glances at me. What kind of a Neanderthal is this who has wandered into the New South Wales Art Gallery by mistake? I managed to work into the conversation. Actually, I have just finished my first book. And he immediately brightened up, congratulated me, and encouraged me to read another one. <laughs> so, sadly, that is a true story. I, uh, for those of you who don't know me, many of you will know my wife Lisa, co-host of the Today Show. I am uh, told by many of my mates the fact that I'm married to Lisa makes me the president of the Australian Men Punching Well Above Their Weight Club. And I am delighted to see so many of my fellow members here today. Uh, I know that you had Ita Buttrose, the great Ita Buttrose, addressing you yesterday. For those of you who were here yesterday, Lisa's career roughly parallel to Ita in magazines, certainly not to that level, but Lisa started with Dolly magazine, then she went to Clio, then Cosmo, then Australian Women's Weekly. As it has been explained to me by her colleagues, Dolly teaches you about your first kiss, Clio about your first orgasm, Cosmo how to fake your first orgasm, and Women's Weekly how to knit your first <laughs> orgasm. I've been asked to speak about happiness, of course, and my book, A Simpler Time, that came out last year. I think, I'm, in fact, I am selling my books uh, afterwards. I'm not going to hijack this occasion and ask you to read my books. I honestly don't care. All I care is that you buy my books. <laughs> but uh, they say if you had a happy childhood, you remember the sun shining, the birds twittering past, the pleasant breeze blowing in your face. If you had an unhappy childhood, you remember wet Wednesday afternoons trudging home from school as the rain trickles down your back. For me, I not only remember the sun shining, I grew up the youngest of seven children on a farm at Peach Ridge, about an hour north of here. But I remember a specific scene, waking up on the veranda of our farmhouse where all the beds were for all the kids, the sun was streaming down and I'd always get the cricket bat out from under the bed and walk very purposefully towards a cricket ball my dad had suspended beneath the gum tree on a piece of string. And as I walked, I could always hear the same things. The dulcet tones of the great ABC cricket broadcaster, Alan McGilvray. And he was always describing the final day of the deciding Ashes test. Here's Fitzsimons and Red path, walking out to open the batting for Australia. Australia always had an almost impossible 360 runs to get on the final day's play. Alas, alas, Red Path went cheaply. Both Chapel brothers let me down. And it was always myself and Dougie Walters left to put on a double century partnership for Australia. Even Dougie left me in the end, and it was always in the final over of the day. It was me shielding DK Lilly from the strike. So I could hit the winning runs on the final ball of the day, which I always did. And if there was still time before Mum would call me for breakfast, I could also win the Davis Cup. 
with, uh, with my good friends jo Tony Roach and John Newcomb. And uh, such, such were my days on the farm. The story would perhaps be better if I went on to play cricket for Australia. I never did. The closest I ever got was the Knox under 14 Ds. Got, uh, selfish, uh, I got 73 not out for the Knox under 14 Ds, which was the closest I ever got to a century. And I would have got a century unless Hugh Sinclair had gone for a selfish run. Um, <laughs> Not that I'm bitter about that. The, the rugby, the, uh, it'd even be better if I did better at rugby. I only, in fact, I wish Gretel had not said out loud that I only played seven tests. I far prefer to say, and it's the absolute truth, David Campisi and I played 108 tests between us. And <laughs> I'm actually a great admirer of Campo. I think probably not quite as great an admirer as Campo himself is. The, um, <laughs> Former Wallaby centre Tim Horne once famously said of Campo that he fell in love with himself at an early age and has remained faithful ever since. <laughs> when I look back upon the life of Pete Ridge, why was the life at Pete Ridge such a happy life? Why does it continue to be happy this day, to this day? We still have that farm. It's in the family. I will be buried there. My parents are buried there. It's a, it, my sons and my daughter know exactly the spot that I want to be put beneath the sod. And the greatest thing about Petridge was not only growing up in a secure family, but it was an absolutely secure and stable community. When I was eight years old, the biggest day in my young life was going to the Royal Easter Show and the Moscow Circus in the same day. Just fantastic. Left the farm, went to the big lights of Sydney, to the big smoke, had this fabulous day at the Easter Show, Moscow Circus, came back that night, and at one o'clock in the morning, too excited to sleep, I started counting up the people that live at Petridge. So I started eight and our household, three in the summer schools, four with the Harrimans, seven with the, Har seven, seven with the Hallets, on and on and on. I got to about 391 and dropped to sleep. The point being that as an eight-year-old boy, I was so locked into my community to know the people around me that I could name them and like them and understand them and they knew me. So that was that tight community. The truth of it is in the 21st century, even though I've moved from a thinly populated community to a heavily populated area in Sydney, the only reason I know the name of my neighbours is because I see the name on the bottom of the affidavits about how tall our fence is. And I'm joking. But there is... <laughs> But you take my point. I know the people one door down and they're lovely people and two doors down, but when we get to three doors down and four doors down, I, there's not that same sense of community. And I, I miss that part. I try to create it in other ways. I put it to you that in this country, I reckon the greatest sense of community that we have had as a nation was in the lead up to the Olympic Games. When, you remember the torch when it landed at Uluru, okay? And the Greek athletes come down and they hand it to Nova Peris Nebone, who runs with it for 500 metres and hands it on and hands it on and hands it on. And how fabulous it was over the next 100 days, the number of people that took their kids 100 miles, 200 miles, 300 miles to see the torch go by, and they said to their kids what I said to mine, you said to yours, remember this moment, soak it up, this is the Olympic spirit. And the best of it came down at Ballarat, where sure enough the man who'd been selected to light the community cauldron shuffled along the main street with the torch held as high as he could. And as he went, there were his four kids waving proudly at their dad. And the youngest of those kids was 85 years old. You remember the story? His name was Jack Lockett. He was a World War I veteran. He was 111 years old. He got the OA, oldest man in Australia. He got the OAM in 2001, which he said he thought stood for oldest man in Australia. <laughs> oldest Australian man. And as he went along the main street of Ballarat, sure enough, there are his four kids waving proudly at their dad. Mabel, 89, Mavis, 87, Jack, Jr., 86, and young John, 85, all wave at their dad <laughs> as he passes. He lights the community cauldron, fa, 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 thump, and the Olympic flame goes off. And it's a colleague of mine from the Sydney Morning Herald who asked the question, on behalf of Australia, how did you, Jack Lockett, get to be the oldest man in Australia? And in his quintessentially Australian response, I hope there's some inspiration for us all. Because he looked straight back at her and he said, yeah, well, I had a lot of worries in my life, but I, I never bloody worried about them. I reckon that is the quintessence of the Australian spirit and the essence of a happy life. All of us have got our worries, but the essence is not to worry too much about them. 
One of the things I wrote in the book, A Simpler Time, was how odd it is that perhaps we can't remember our first day at school or our first kiss or our first time in being selected in a team or whatever, but we remember these strange, odd moments. And it's like a beer glass with these little bubbles and you sort of keep tracing the bubbles down and you think, why do I remember that moment? And for me, one of those times, and it made a huge impact on me, um, was late at night. I must have been nine years old uh, and mum and I were... Some, for some reason I was allowed to stay up. We were watching this old black and white movie and everybody else had gone to bed. And the climax of the movie was this old man, and he may be 85 years old, and he had his arm around this very upset 22-year-old, 21-year-old girl. I remember her ponytails and she was crying and she was upset and she was down. And this man made the best speech I'd ever heard, this old man, and he said, my dear, you must understand that the force of life, the spirit of life that makes the birds sing, that makes the trees grow, that makes the flowers bloom, is the same spirit of life, the force of life that is in you, and you must embrace it, and you must suck the juice from the marrow of life until it runs down your chin. Did nothing for you, but I loved it. I loved that notion. I can never forget hearing those lines, suck the juice from the marrow of life until it runs down your chin. And what I took from it was that, that you don't faff around the edges. It doesn't need to be pretty, but it needs to be passionate. You need to feel it strongly. You need to, you need to get into what you're doing. When I talk to school children about how to decide whether they're in the right gig or the wrong gig, I say, look to the clock on the wall. If it says, when you start your job, if it says 13 past nine, and you immediately dot three, carry one, subtract two, and work out that in three hours and 17 minutes, you will be at lunch, and at 2.30 in the afternoon, you're waiting for it to be five o'clock, and on a Tuesday, you want it to be a Friday, and it's August, you want it to be December, you're in the wrong gig. You've got to. You've got to get yourself into a job where you look to the clock on the wall and it says 10 past nine and the next time you look up, it says 10 to six and you don't know where the day's gone but you regret it because you so much love what you're doing, you're so impassioned by what you're doing that the time flies by and it's not about how much you're getting paid an hour or any of that kind of stuff, it's about you are into what you're doing. I love the line from Vladimir Nabokov, the great Russian writer who said, common sense tells us that our existence is but a brief crack of light between two eternal walls of darkness. I love that, I live that, I believe that. Common sense tells us that our existence is but a brief, brief crack of light between two eternal walls of darkness. If you're religious, you're okay. You've got eternal life waiting for you. Not me. I've got this thin, thin... <laughs> I've got this thin band of life, that, this band of light that is my life, and I want my band of life to be a rainbow crashing into a kaleidoscope factory at the very instant a train filled with paint also comes in from the other side. I want colour, I want movement, I don't want to piss my time up against the wall doing stuff that I don't want to do. I want to feel impassioned by it. I, I feel so blessed to have discovered, not discovered, but found out, trying different things until I found the thing that I was passionate for, which was writing. I love, I love writing. I was, I was so lucky. I go back to, you know, the, the thing I suppose when I go back to the farm, that I was blessed to have a father that uh, loved poetry. And when we were in the tomato packing shed, dad would always teach us poetry night after night to remember the, stand, the stands of movement at the station for the word had passed around, that the cult from old regret had got away. She joined the wild bush horses and was worth a thousand pounds and all the cracks had gathered to the fray. And you get to the climactic moment of that poem, that poem that I always loved, when they reached the mountain summit, even Clancy took a pull, for it well might make the boldest hold their breath, for the hidden ground was full of wombat holes, and any slip meant death. But the man from Snowy River let the pony have his head. He swung his stock whip round and gave a cheer, and he raced it down the mountain like a torrent down its bed, while the others stood and watched in very fear. That, for what it's worth, infused into my bones, into my bone marrow, the idea that not happiness necessarily, but satisfaction, passion comes from getting to the point where everybody else pulls back. And you're so passionate about it, bang, you race it down the mountain like a torrent down its bed. For me, again, oddly enough, early on, I found that in rugby, 
Um, I know that rugby is by no means a universal passion. Um, often I might say I think there are people here from Adelaide and Perth, often if I'm well, in Adelaide, Launceston, often if I'm in places like that I have to explain the differences between rugby union and rugby league. I say I played rugby union, John Hopperwadi played rugby league. I always, however, go on to defend John Hopawati, of course, a rose to notoriety around the world for using his finger in the tackle. We all know the story. It is, however, the most classic example of our time of the terrible damage that can be done by a simple misunderstanding. <laughs> True story, that day, just before he went out, his coach took him aside, put his arm around him and said, now today, Hopper, I want you to make your mark in the annals of rugby league. <laughs> but. I suppose for me that uh, that notion of it doesn't have to be pretty but it has to be passionate and you have to feel it strongly and you needn't care what other people think about it came together for me in rugby and I, as I say I know it's not a universal passion the nearest I get to explaining it to those who don't get it uh, on the eve of the Rugby World Cup final in Sydney in 2003 I happened to be travelling south on the Sydney Harbour Bridge behind a battered old ute and at the back of this ute was this old mongrel bloodhound dog and I was very interested to observe its behaviour it was this sleety horrible day just like today, going south across the Harbour Bridge, and the back of this ute, this old mongrel black hand dog, and instead of doing the sensible thing, which was to take shelter down behind the cab out of the wind and the rain and the sleet and the cold, instead of that it jammed its big ugly mutt head right out into the oncoming rush of wind, meaning that on one side its big ears just hitting like this, the other side its slobbering tongue jackhammering the other way. The stupidest thing a dog ever did having the best time a dog ever had. <laughs> and for me, driving behind, I felt an instant sense of brotherhood with that dog. <laughs> I felt if that dog could be a human, that dog would be a rugby player. And <laughs> I might say in all honesty, these days, if ever I see one of those prissy, prancing, pompous little poodles bouncing along on a leash behind mistress, I always think, there goes a golfer. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave you with two more things. I think I've got time unless somebody winds me up shortly. I'll, I'll v finish very quickly. The other thing I feel, I feel happy about so many things. For what it's worth, I, for me and everybody invents it in different ways. For me, a sense of family is a crucial thing to me. I, I, how do I define myself? Not by the things that Gretel introduced me by, as kind as they were. I define myself as the youngest Fitzsimons of the Fitzsimons family of Peach Ridge. And that sort of, that grounding in family for me is my, the root of my happiness for what it's worth. Of the many things I feel happy about, I feel very happy to be in Australia. I feel happy, I feel blessed to, to live in this country. I look around and I think, yes, we have our problems. And if you listen to Talkback Radio, you'd think that we're beset by millions and millions of problems. Yes, we've got problems. But as a nation, I think we're a fantastic nation with a wonderful future. When I was doing the hardest professional exercise I, had, I took on in my life so far, I was writing the biography of the former opposition leader, Kim Beasley. I knew so little about my subject when I began that after my first meeting with Kim in Canberra, I flew back to Sydney in what I thought was triumph, sent an email to my editor-in-chief saying I've just agreed to write Kim Beasley's biography, I might be needing some time off. He sent me back an email saying, well done, I'm sure you'll do yourself and the Herald proud. I think you should know, however, that Beasley is spelt with a Z. <laughs> and, and so began the two most dreadful years of my life staring at the cracks in the ceiling night after night thinking, God help me, whatever made me think I could write a political biography. And I always went back to a story the Herald had sent me on in 95 to accompany Mr Gough Whitlam on a five-day sojourn to Perth. And I've never forgotten that trip for going through the ANSET air terminal at Sydney Airport, such as it then was. Mr Whitlam leading the way, me with the carry-on luggage behind, both his and mine. And as we went through the metal detectors, Mr Whitlam must have still had his house keys or his car keys in his pocket, because sure enough there was a sudden <coughs> like that. The little guys came in to hover all over him with those metal wand detectors, and Mr Whitlam, without breaking his stride, turned to them and said, I think you'll find it's my aura. <laughs> so, it was... 
it was in the course of that book that I really reflected on how fabulous it is to be an Australian. And the best thing about this country is our egalitarianism, our notion that no one's better than us and we're better than no one. And I think, you know, somebody in public life, the six most dangerous words that can ever be attributed to you is, don't you know who I am? You are dead from that moment as an Australian if you say that. But, and that, the wonderful thing about it is that the gap between the richest and most powerful and the, those that are the most impoverished is not is not that great. It may be in the bank account, but not in the feeling between us. And the best example I can offer, and this is absolutely what happened. In 1991, after six months of faxes and phone calls, I was finally able to achieve an interview with the Prime Minister of the day, Bob Hawke. All he could spare me was 10 minutes at halftime of a soccer game between Australia and Brazil. But sure enough, into the Sydney Football Stadium, corporate box at halftime, came Mr Hawke. Prime Minister of Australia sat down, other people milling around, just the two of us at this table. And I put the tape recorder on the table. I said, sir, tell me about your greatest sporting moment. And he set the scene. There he was on the third fairway of the Royal Canberra Golf Course. And at the moment that he struck the ball, it was the sweetest sound as he'd ever heard as it sailed away towards the green, a little bit to the left, but he'd made allowance for the wind. Lands on the green, a little bit to the right, but the spin that he's put upon it. And it's just trickling towards the cup for a hole in one. The only one in his life and the only time a sitting president or prime minister had ever got a hole in one. He's just getting to the climactic moment when suddenly a waitress appears. Nice, middle-aged woman, thingamabob in the hair, with the white apron, who without so much as a buy your leave or <coughs> excuse me, Mr Hawke, anything like that, simply said, how will you have your coffee, Mr Hawke? Bob Hawke, no eye contact whatsoever, imperiously flicked his left hand. His way of saying, I am the Prime Minister, I'm getting to the climactic moment of a fabulous story that will run page one of tomorrow's Sydney Morning Herald. Hang on a moment, I'll give you the order in a second. That is not what he said, but that is what that meant. And she, to her eternal Australian credit, didn't hesitate half a second, said, how will you have your coffee, Mr Hawke? <laughs> and I cannot do justice to his reply, <laughs> but it was, it was like his left eyebrow was a fat caterpillar slumbering in the sun <laughs> that suddenly got 240 volts for us because it shoots up his forehead. He fixes her with this laser beam stare and he starts in on her. <laughs> Barks at her for about 10 seconds, she flounces off and returns one minute later with a beautiful cup of creamy coffee and two Tim Tam biscuits for me and nothing for the Prime Minister. <laughs> um, as, I, as I sat there sipping my coffee and eating both of my Tim Tams, while he had diddly squat, I thought, what a terrific country this is to be in. <laughs> you wouldn't see that in any other country in the world. Can you imagine the President of the United States, the Queen of England, the Chancellor of Germany, the President of Russia, the Emperor of Japan ever being treated in such a cavalier fashion as that? But we do it in this nation on a daily basis, and long may it last. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll, um, Thank you. I'll leave you, I'll leave you with this. The, uh, the, uh, the other great joy of my life, I mean, as I say, has been writing stories, meeting fabulous people. I'm often asked the, the uh, you know, great, great people that I've met. Um, one of them is an extraordinary woman, Nancy Wake. She died on the 5th of August last year, most decorated heroine of the Second World War. I met her in 2000. I wrote her biography and released in 2001. Uh, an amazing woman. Uh, she was born in New Zealand in 1912, uh, came good a few years later, moved to Australia. Ran away, ran away from home, landed in London in 31 to study journalism, was posted to Paris to document the rise of Nazism across Europe. As soon as the war broke out in 39, she joined the French resistance and she finished the war as one woman leading 7,000 French men, partisans in the forest of France. She was this modern day Joan of Arc. And uh, so that, the, me doing that book with her for a year and that went well and that led to me doing Tobruk and Kokoda and other stories with a the military theme. It's because of that that I'm aware of the significance. It hasn't been in the papers yet, 
but it'll come up in eight days' time, 2nd of March, today, the 10th of March, and I'll finish on this, will be the 70th anniversary of an extremely important moment in the Second World War, because it was the first time that a radio station went out live to a news event as it actually happened. So it was the first time they sent out these broadcast vans, instead of having to race the tapes back to the studio, spool them through, it was coming out live. And it was, of course, at the height of the Battle of Britain that the famous BBC broadcaster Jonathan Smithers with rising excitement in his voice said, and now, ladies and gentlemen, we cross live to the Dover airfields where the Battle of Britain is at its height. Are you there, Godfrey Hornblower? And if you listen to it on the tape in the Imperial War Museum in Knightsbridge in London, as I have, it would raise the hairs on the back of your neck because you get about five seconds of crackle, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing. And then you hear as clear as a bell, meow, 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 the sounds of the planes taking off and landing. And then the voice of Godfrey Hornblower comes back, absolutely stunned that this new technology is working. He says, yes, yes, I'm here, Jonathan, and I'm here with one of the pilots originally from Ireland but flying for Great Britain today. What? What's it like up there, Seamus O'Flaherty? And the voice of the Irish pilot, Seamus O'Flaherty, crystal clear, his exact words, he said, well, it's tough. There were fuckers to the left of me. There were fuckers to the right. There were three fuckers at two o'clock and two fuckers at 11 o'clock and another fucker behind me. And there's this sudden stunned silence rather in the manner with which Great Colleen has greeted me now. And it goes on the tape for 11 seconds before Godfrey Hornblower can gather himself to say, I, 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 I think we should explain to the BBC One audience that the fucking is a type of German aircraft. <laughs> Aye, that they are, but these fuckers were Messerschmitts. 